You know, I love the new year. I love starting a new year. It just feels fresh. It feels new. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to um, have a new beginning. It feels like you kind of reset your life and you can uh, maybe make some new decisions, maybe recreate yourself. Uh, but this time of year, we always want to change, right? Everybody says this year is going to be different. And uh, I believe that this year can be different. I believe it can be different than it was last year. It doesn't have to be the same old, same old. But uh, I personally believe that this can be your best year yet. I really do. I believe that if we can start this year off right, I believe this this can be the best year of your life. And not just for us personally, but I believe that this can be the best year that this church has ever seen. And I I'm personally am excited about seeing what God will do in this church in 2017. Aren't you, aren't you excited to see what God's going to do? I believe that this year God has some, some supernatural blessings for you and for your family and for this church beyond even what we could pray for, even beyond what we could imagine. Uh, so I want to talk today about the keys to unlocking those blessings that He has in store for us. And so if you have your Bible this morning, we're going to turn to a very familiar passage of Scripture, easy to find, <coughs> Genesis 1-1. That's on page one in my Bible. Uh, you'll probably be close to that in your Bible. There's a Bible in the back of your pew if you want to grab that. And if you don't own a Bible this morning, you're welcome to take that one with you. Genesis 1-1, we're just going to read one verse this morning. Uh, hope that's okay with you. Genesis 1-1, and we probably don't even uh, need to look down to be able to read it, but it says... In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now we're going to stop right there, and we're going to pray this morning. So if you would, let's pray. Uh, God, we come to you this morning, and we want, to, we want to say, God, that we need you in this year. Father, we need you in this house this morning. And Father, as we start a brand new year, Father, I pray that our focus could be on you. Lord, let our hearts and our minds be set on you. And ready to receive what you have for us this year. God, I pray that you'd touch my body and allow me to speak clearly this morning. And Father, I pray that you'd touch our hearts and our minds and help us to be ready to receive it. It's through Jesus we pray this morning. <coughs> Amen. So I believe that there are two types of people in the world. Uh, just two. Just two types, and these two types of people uh, all over the world, any uh, continent or any culture, people will fall into these two types of people. And everybody in this room, we could divide up, and uh, one group of people could sit on one side, and one people, one group of people could sit on the other side. And, um, those two groups of people are people who value organization, and then people who don't so there's t and, and usually every couple has one of these uh, one of both of these and so one person will be really organized and one person uh, will not be very organized is this is this true do you, do you, is this your life uh, some people are just really passionate about keeping things organized everything has a place and a spot and you're supposed to keep it in that spot and if you use it after you get done using it, you take it directly back to that spot. And then there's some people who are just not, it's just not important to them. And one side thinks the other side is piggish, and one side thinks the other side is prudish. And so it's just hard to get along. It's hard to cross these boundary lines of organization. Have you felt this tension before, this that you know, one, one person wants to stay organized and one person does not want to stay organized. I, ca I could be organized, okay? I could be. I, I have the capability to be. I just don't feel like it's a worthwhile venture. As long as I know where everything is, it doesn't matter if you do or not. So that's kind of how I am. And I, I'm not the organized person. I'm 
way on the other end of the spectrum. It really doesn't matter to me if it's organized or not. And uh, some of you who have been around me a little while, you would know that that's, you know, organization is just not on the top of my priorities list. <laughs> but uh, some people have trouble uh, living in the chaos of messiness, right? So if you're the organized person and, and you walk into a messy situation, you're like, ah, I can't handle this, I can't stand this. I cannot live in this kind of environment. Are you that person? We could raise hands, and but then there'd be hurt feelings. And but some people just can't stand the structure of organization, and and that's me and some of you in this room. Uh, but it doesn't really matter how organized you can keep your socks. Uh, all of our lives tend to get messy sometimes, don't they? They tend to get chaotic, and it's hard to, uh, whether or not you keep your uh, Tupperware organized or not, or your life gets unorganized, it gets messy, it gets full of junk sometimes, right? We all have a tendency to drift towards chaos in our life, where everything's hectic, and the pace of life is just fast. And everything seems like it's just thrown here and there and wherever you can fit in this and that, that's, that's where it goes. And December is the worst month of the year for that. December is supposed to be the most spiritual month of the year. It's Christmas when Jesus came, but for many of us it's the most frustrating time of the year. Life gets busy during December. You pledge time to things that you don't have time for. You uh, spend money that you don't have to buy presents for your kids that they won't play with. And then January comes around, you eat food that you don't have any room for. And then January comes around and you're filled with regret, right? You're filled with the holiday hangover where everything was just so chaotic and so many dinners and so many uh, family events and so many presents. It, life is just chaotic. Does anybody ever experience this before, the, the holiday hangover? I believe that this morning... God really doesn't care if your socks are organized by color and length and how many times you've wore them. But I do believe that he cares about the way your life is organized. I believe that, that God has set an order about how your life is to be lived. And that's what we read about this morning. It says, the scripture we read this morning says, In the beginning, God... In the beginning, God. God, right from the right off the bat, in the beginning of his book, he was telling Moses what to write so that people would know who he is and how to live in response to that. And the first thing that he has in pen is in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. I believe that God was saying, I was before the beginning. I was before everything came into existence. And I am to be before everything else in your life. God wants to be number one in your life. And he's not some kind of prideful jerk that demands first place. But God's not content with anything less than being number one in your life but our life it tends to drift away from that God it doesn't feel entitled to your affection God is the only thing worthy of your affection he is the only thing worthy of your attention God is above everything he's outside of time and space He's outside of our uh, three-dimensional, four-dimensional world. <coughs> God 
He didn't begin in the beginning. God began the beginning. God started this whole thing and he is the only one worthy of the number one place in our life. But I can't help but think that as God was thinking this whole thing up, that's hard to imagine that just one day God sat down and he thought all of us and everybody in the world, he just thought about us. But uh, as he was looking down through the portals of time, he knew that we would have the tendency to drift in the wrong direction. He knew that we would have the tendency to allow other things to, to go first in our life. But God said right from the beginning of his book, he says, Put me first. Put me in the beginning of your year. Put me in the beginning of your day. And you will see blessings. I can create things in your life. I can do miracles in your life if you will put me first. Put me first. He wants to be number one in our lives. God wants the seat of honor in your life. He doesn't want to have to to, uh, take second place to anything. He wants to be the most important thing in your life. We have this, in this fast 21st century world, we have a tendency to dethrone God. And so what I mean is that when God created you and me, He created a throne in our hearts. A place where your whole life would be ruled from. And he created that seat for himself. And he said, this is where I want to sit in your heart. I want to sit in the control seat of your life. But it's so easy for us to allow other things to sit on his throne. We have a tendency to push him out of that seat in our life. For some of us, for all of us, this looks different, but for some of us, kids or grandkids have the tendency to push their way in to the thrones in our life where our whole life is controlled by them. And by no means am I saying that um, you should neglect your kids or grandkids. I'm just saying that you shouldn't let them rule your life. Some of you kids this morning, and I'm not pointing this to anybody, but uh, have never heard no. And because of that, they're ruling your life. They're calling the shots in your life. For some of you, uh, your spouse is the object of your affection and your attention. I'm not saying you shouldn't love your, your wife or your husband. What I am saying is that they can't see it in God's seed in your life. They can't see, see it at number one. It wouldn't be right for you and it wouldn't be right for them. For some of you, it's a job or an investment. It has started controlling your life, making your decisions for you. It's controlling how you live. For some people, it's a hobby that you're just obsessed over. Or for some of us, it may even be food. What sits on the throne of your heart this morning? What is it that you are most willing to give up money for? What is it that consumes your thought life? Who's sitting in that seat of control in your life? Could it be that the reason you're unhappy with your current situation is because you have dethroned God? You have set something up in your life in that seat that He didn't design to be there. Things will naturally creep up our priority list if we are not careful about who sits on the throne of our heart. Jesus says in Matthew 6, He's talking to His disciples and He says, Listen, I know that life is chaotic. I know that life is hectic. And I know that you're going to have a tendency to focus on getting things. And you're going to focus on getting power. 
and you're going to focus on getting control and you're going to focus on food and what you wear and where you're going and where you're going to live. But he says, but seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. And all these other things, all the things that you're concerned about, all the things that are consuming your mind, they'll all be given to you. Because here's the truth this morning. When you put God in his rightful place in your heart, everything else will fall into place. When you get him at the center of your heart, the center of your life, the center of your affection and your attention, everything else falls into place. We allow things to distract us and deflect us away from focusing on God. And it's so easy to do. It doesn't happen in a moment. It happens gradually over time. There's a song that Casting Crowns used to sing. It says that it's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It it doesn't happen in a moment, but life just creeps up on you. And so what we need to do is... We need to take time to do a spiritual reset. To get our mind off of the things of this world and on to the one who created the world. (coughs) We need to take some time and put God back on the throne of our lives. And so that's why that I sit down with the deacons the other day and we decided that the church is going to do a 21 day fast and uh, I know that that sounds a little scary right from the start but uh, I'm going to talk about fasting just briefly this morning but uh, we're going to talk about it more extensively next week but on January 10th until January 31st we're going to uh, at least at some level at some level all of us will be participating in the fast, 21 days of prayer and fast, and as a spiritual reset for our lives, to make sure that going into this year, that God is on the throne of our heart. And so what that's going to look like is uh, at 6 a.m. on weekdays and at 8 a.m. on Saturdays, we're going to be meeting here in the sanctuary for prayer. And I know that all of you won't be available to do that, and that's fine, but if you could, for these 21 days... uh, Come out at 6 a.m. and at 8 a.m. on Saturdays. And let's pray. If we want to see God use our church, if we want to see souls saved, prayer is the way we unlock that. This week I was here at Celebrate Recovery and I hadn't planned on sharing this, but As I I sit here and I was getting some things ready for the service and uh, three guys walked in, court ordered to be here and I'd seen plenty of guys come through the door uh, since I've been coming to celebrate recovery but these three guys were different because I graduated with them and it was a gut check for me that people my age could be dying today and dying lost. And I want us to do everything that we can to change that. And so if it means for me giving up some food and showing up at church at 6 a.m. in the morning, that sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. We want to take time right at the first of this year And we want to put God first. We want to prioritize God in this season of our lives. These 21 days of prayer and fasting, they're going to teach us to depend on God. They're going to teach us to put God first in our days and how to put God first in our hearts. I believe that fasting is the catalyst for miracles in our church. For supernatural breakthroughs. For God to do amazing things. So I know that for many of us, fasting may be a foreign concept. It may be something that we really don't know much about. But uh, fasting is 
a spiritual reset. It's taking time to say, God, you are the most important thing in my life. You are the thing that I want more than even the things that I have to have. And uh, there's going to be, as you leave this morning, there's going to be some packets in the back on the table. And these are uh, kind of an extensive guide to fasting. Uh, It's by Bill Bright. And if you would take one of those this morning as you leave and read that this week, it'll give you a good handle about uh, what fasting is and how to do it. But fasting, is, is, it clears the channels between us and God. We don't fast so that God will give us something. We fast so that God will work in us, so that God will change our hearts. And so that God will change our minds. It's spiritual alignment with God. And so God is here and sometimes we're here but sometimes we're over here. Fasting brings us back into spiritual alignment with God. It allows us to see God's will for our life. It gives us clarity and direction for our lives. Fasting is setting God back on his throne. And so we'll talk more about that next week. Uh, So be sure to come back if you want to participate in the fast. Um, As I close this morning, I want to ask you a question. What is it that you have set on God's throne in your heart? What is it that has creeped in? What is it that has controlled your life? What is it that has become the object of your affection? What have you given priority in your life? What is it this morning that you need to lay down? (coughs) Who or what is sitting on the throne of your heart? Do you have the same passion for Jesus that you once had? The same fire for lost people? Or have you grown cold in your relationship with Jesus this morning? Has he been put on the back burner of your life? Today you can have a fresh start. Today you can put him first in your life. I was thinking this morning about the new year and and fresh beginnings. But you don't have to start this morning with just a new beginning. But you can start with a new heart. And a new life, Second Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is an all new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And so that's what Christ is offering us today. New life through him. Yeah, you've messed up this year, this last year. Yeah, you, you may have put something on God's... But this morning, he's not mad at you. He's not disappointed. He just longs to be close to you. He longs to to control your life, not for the sake of control, but because he knows how to give you the best life. He's a good father who loves us and wants the best for us. But he also knows that we can only have the best if he is first place in our life. He wants us to depend on Him like a little child. Depending on Him for even the simplest things in our life. (coughs) This morning, maybe 2016 was a rough year for you. Some of you have experienced loss. Some of you have experienced unbearable pain, sickness. And some of you are carrying burdens from 2016. But this morning Jesus says to you, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. So this morning this altar is going to be open in just a second, but right now I want to pray for us. God, uh, we're all guilty. Of putting something else other than you on the throne of our heart. 
And God, we're sorry. We're sorry. God, in these 21 days, starting January 10th, God, we want to we rethrone you. God, we want to put you at the center of our lives, God. And I pray that we would start that today. God, I pray that today we could recommit our lives to you. God, that we could, we could set our focus on you. And God, that you would just give us grace where we fall. God, we love you this morning and we need you. And it's through Jesus we pray. Amen.